TR, welcome back to our plywood series. Thanks, Jim. Good to be here. Yeah. Poked around on the APA website, which is quite a quite a resource I have found <laughs> over the last few years. Absolutely. I mean, a really great resource, and they're doing a lot of good work for our, for our industry. So I stole a few things from there. In my mind going into it, I was thinking, ah, oh, you know, they just started making some plywood around 1960 and started sheeting some roofs <laughs> and throwing on the walls. But I come to find out, like a lot of things, it had started a long time ago. So it looks like there was actually a patent uh, applied for and issued back in 1865. But you'd mentioned you knew a little bit about the 1905 World's Fair in Portland. The, uh, the Portland Manufacturing Company created an exhibit for the fair where several panels were laid up for display. They called it three-ply veneer work. Well, I know it was a, it was a huge event. Um, one of the bigger World's Fairs, I believe. Uh, it, if you're familiar with the Portland area, the, the whole Pearl District, which is Northwest Portland, that was just, uh, it was a huge, like, I don't know, couple hundred acres, three or four, five hundred acres of exhibits and many really, really nice buildings that they have. If you look at old Portland photos, you'll you can you can see the uh, what what they went through to, to put this fair on. Yeah. It's quite an event. Yeah. Well, TR, we've got another slide here. Uh, looks like in the first 15 years of the industry, sales were primarily to customers creating door panels. But in 1920, the LA Bay Mill Company based out of Seattle started developing customers in the auto industry. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as far as running boards. But I thought this would be interesting. Maybe you could touch a little bit on this 1929 yeah. fact. Well, what you're seeing here is in 1929, we're seeing momentum build and uh, Pacific Northwest is the heart of the plywood industry. It's going to take a few decades before it moves out of the Pacific Northwest into Southern Yellow Pine and or offshore. And, you know, all the professionals were building their craft in the Pacific Northwest. You know, the mill managers, the superintendents, these are the guys that know how to make plywood. Yeah, so. right on. Well, we mentioned running boards. Yeah. <laughs> I had to chuckle when I just had this vision of those old muddy, wet streets in Seattle, dirt yeah. roads, and you've got plywood <laughs> without even glue. Yeah. And you can imagine what that was looked like for a, yeah. for a running board, so that was pretty good. Yeah. But gosh, really, so in 1934, imagine that, innovation, a chemist at Harbor Plywood Corp uh, finally developed a fully waterproof adhesive. So you talk yeah. about a game changer yeah. there, right? Exterior glue was yeah. born, so uh, yeah, big deal, which allows it now to be used as, uh, you know, on roofs or walls or what have you, but uh, shiplap yeah. walls and things like yeah. that, floors and walls and roofs. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah I, I think another lesson besides the obviously the running board challenges that the the industry faced, it was totally fragmented, right? You had all seventeen mills, give or take, who knows, a right. few more at that point, doing their own thing, just trying to figuring it out. No standards. 1933, some mills get together and form the Douglas Fir Plywood Association, and helped organize everybody and kind of pull it together. 1938, the FHA began accepting plywood, and you're familiar with that, right? And Absolutely, so what you've got going here is you've got your first product standard, and it frees it up to where you can use it in home building. And that's what is the catalyst for you know, more mills, more production, and uh, it kind of leads us to where we are today. Um, unbelievable amount of growth uh, between you know the late 30s and and you know call it the 1990 for that matter and that's where we kind of peaked in how many mills we actually had you know producing plywood yeah okay World War II shoot that uh, that was a big deal that was a big deal I think even in some of the the mills you worked in they kind of got really right. built their right. their book of business in the world in the in the during world war ii so that served as a proving ground for a lot of things uh pt boats huts for the cbs and storage crates all kinds of things so now all of a sudden you're putting that standardized product out into real life testing where it really matters absolutely <laughs> the, the, yeah. the united states survival is <laughs> yeah and <laughs> yes. and uh you know we go up to you know 1.8 billion square feet in the war years so you know, it uh, it started cranking up, and uh, yeah, I think it just became a more viable product for people. Uh, and you know, home building was next in line. That's right. Yeah. Well, and then after the war, uh, we know a lot of things happened, right? 
1954, 101 mils. Mm -hmm. So it looks like some of the R&D out there, and you can speak to this a little bit, figured out how to glue together veneer from softwood species in other regions. So that's a whole game changer. Because sure. before, up till then, it was just... So it was all dug fir. Um, they were actually leaving all the other species in the woods, including hemlock, which is a, you know, a huge product at this point in our, in our world. Douglas fir is stable, the moisture content is even, and, and it's an easy species to put through the dryer. When you have veneer from hemlock or southern yellow pine or other species, they have a higher moisture content, it's harder to get a consistent dry veneer. What that can lead to is if you don't have that, you'll get blows when you enter the hot press. And blows are caused by moisture pockets in the veneer coming under heat and compression, and it wrecks the panel. So it's kind of a wasted effort if you can't get the veneer dried properly. But they started figuring that out, and uh, yeah, Southern Yellow Pine was born in 1964 by Georgia Pacific. Yeah, and you can see today around two thirds of the plywood produced is in the South. Yeah. Yeah, which just don't think about. I know a lot of Southern Yellow Pine treated framing lumber comes sure. out of there, things yeah. like that. Yeah, big and treating down there. What you have down in the South is a, a shorter growing cycle. So the, the, the timber, 30, 35 years of growth, they harvest it and they can peel it or, or cut it into studs or whatever they want to do. We're more, we're more like 45 years of growth out here, I would say on the average before we harvest. But in the South, they can really turn it around fast. And you kind of mentioned to me or, uh, earlier in our conversation, just you said there's sort of a range in history of where this kind of grew and it peaked as far as production. Can yeah. you touch on that? I would say, you know, in, by 1990, there was just, uh, you know, an immense amount of uh, panels being produced. OSB wasn't in the game yet. Fir plywood and southern yellow pine plywood were just cranking out massive amounts of, 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 of uh, product. Yeah. Knowing what you know uh, at the mill level these days with respect to panel goods, are we in a good place as far as supply going forward and or what kind of dynamics are impacting yeah. that in your mind? Yeah, so what's happened with plywood and, and OSB, OSB has displaced a lot of plywood in the home package. But plywood has found its way into kind of where it was born, the industrial markets. You know, like I said earlier, you know, Doug fir is stable. And even mixed with other species in the core lines, it's still stable. And it just services certain industrial applications uh, remarkably well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I really appreciate us taking the time to go through this from give yeah. or take yeah. 1865 to today. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, TR. Thank you. Thank you.